You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 73, The Munich Agreement, Part 5. We had no other choice. This week, a big thank you goes out to John and Alan for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they get access to special member-only episodes, plus ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. Over the course of the last two weeks of September 1938, the ongoing tension between the Czechoslovakian government on one side and the Sudeten Germans on the other would be solved. It would involve both personal meetings between the political leaders of various nations, followed by a four-nation summit to finalize the agreement. These talks were initiated with the goal of coming to a definitive solution that would, at least it was hoped, be a lasting one. The eventual outcome would be the cession of certain territories from Czechoslovakia to Germany. One of the nations that would not be involved in any of these discussions was Czechoslovakia itself. The level of frustration in Czechoslovakia would grow, as it would be forced by its supposed friends into greater and greater sacrifices in the name of possible peace. During September, they would be presented with what amounted to multiple ultimatums. If they did not agree to what was being suggested, then Germany would likely declare war, and the British and French would not be there to assist them. The Western nations were trying to avoid a war that they did not believe that they could win, or even really contribute to in any way, that would help Czechoslovakia. This feeling of military helplessness was not just an opinion circulating around the political circles of London and Paris, but also among those nations' militaries. There would be a report by the British chiefs of staff, making it clear that they did not believe that there was anything that Britain or France could do to hinder a German invasion and conquest of Czechoslovakia something that they estimated would only take a few weeks. And it was with this very pessimistic view of the military options available that the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain would set off for his first meeting with Hitler. Chamberlain would begin his journey at 7.45 in the morning, at which point he would begin his trip from the Prime Minister's residence at number 10 and head to the airport. Then at 8.30 he would speak to the BBC before boarding the plane, saying, quote, I'm going to meet the German Chancellor because the present situation seems to me to be one in which discussions between him and me may have useful consequences. My policy has always been to try to ensure peace, and the Fuhrer's ready acceptance of my suggestion encourages me to hope that my visit to him will not be without results, End quote. He would then fly to Germany, where he would be greeted by several thousand spectators, along with a fleet of 14 Mercedes vehicles that would take him to the rail station. By 5 p.m., he had arrived at the Berghof, where he was greeted by Hitler and Keitel. Hands were shaken and the group went inside, where it was decided that Chamberlain and Hitler would converse for the most part alone, with only a translator. Now, this is an important piece of information, because almost all of the information we have about the conversations that would follow would be sourced from notes written by Chamberlain after the meeting was over. And those notes would be from memory. You know, he was not taking notes during the meeting itself. While Chamberlain had been in transit, back in Czechoslovakia, the ever-fluid situation had changed again, with Henlein having made a proclamation stating that it was now the belief of the Sudeten German party that the only viable path forward was the full annexation of the Sudeten areas by Germany. 
This robbed Chamberlain of any real ability to discuss the primary reason for his visit, which was the organization of some kind of agreement which would probably involve a plebiscite among the German areas so that they could decide their own fate. When the meeting with Hitler started, as he would so often do, the German leader went off on a monologue, reiterating all the things that he had been complaining about for the better part of two decades. The Treaty of Versailles, unfair disarmament negotiations, the effects of the Great Depression, and many other items that he considered to be slights against Germany. Eventually, he did get around to Anglo-German relations, and when that topic was finally broached, more criticism followed about the British positions that they had sort of talked about in public, and statements that they had made during the long Czechoslovak saga. He even openly questioned the future of the Anglo-German naval agreement that had been signed in 1935. Hitler then turned to one of his favorite topics during this period, the treatment of Germans living outside German borders. Chamberlain then asked him for a clear statement that if the Sudeten Germans were included in Germany, that there would be no further German expansion, which he did not receive a clear answer to. Hitler launched into another monologue, including that it was, quote, impossible that Czechoslovakia should remain like a spearhead in Germany's side, but he did not want a lot of Czechs, he, all he wanted was Sudeten Germans, end quote. Now, this sort of statement and the agreements that it was obviously asking for, you know, Hitler wanting all of the Sudeten Germans, of course, ran into the same kinds of problems that had been encountered during similar discussions back at the Paris Peace Conference, all the way back in 1919, so almost 20 years in the past. How specifically do you delineate borders when you're talking about groups of people that are intermingled together? Chamberlain was very interested in discussing these details, really hunting for some kind of indication of what Hitler considered to be a reasonable percentage benchmark for if an area should move over to Germany. Was it over 50%? which would probably mean following along what would be plebiscite lines, most likely, or should it be higher? If the benchmark was set really high, say in areas that were 80% German to prevent moving Czechs into Germany, it would still mean the movement of many non-German individuals into the German Reich, and many Germans would remain in Czechoslovakia. Hitler, as was so often the case in many of these conversations, was not really interested in discussing the real and nitty-gritty details of possible solutions. Throughout the conversation, he would also make several veiled threats, but he would eventually say, after getting a bit frustrated, that, quote, I shall not put up with this any longer. I shall settle this question one way or another. I shall take matters into my own hands, end quote. To which Chamberlain sort of called his bluff a little bit, saying, quote, If I've understood you correctly, then you're determined in any event to proceed against Czechoslovakia. If that is your intention, why have you had me coming to Berchtesgaden at all? Under these circumstances, it's best if I leave straight away. Apparently, it's all pointless. End quote. Then Hitler, in the clearest statement of his future actions, would say, quote, I am ready to face a world war. I am 49 years old, and I want to still be young enough to lead my people to victory. But while Hitler would escalate the conversation to one of war, he would also very clearly then de-escalate saying, if you recognize the principle of self-determination for the treatment of the Sudeten question, then we can discuss how to put the principle into practice. With this, Chamberlain had finally gotten Hitler's agreement on what he wanted. An agreement, maybe not for a plebiscite, but at least the desire to negotiate a peaceful settlement which would see some amount of territory change hands. With that, Chamberlain would say that he had to return to London to discuss this solution with the British cabinet, and he asked Hitler for his assurance that no military action would be taken until he had discussed it with the cabinet and then more discussions could be arranged between the two leaders. This was readily agreed to by Hitler, as he was not planning on launching his invasion for another few weeks anyway, so the promise not to proceed with the invasion for a few days cost nothing but gained him a lot of goodwill. Chamberlain would then make his way back to London, and when he arrived he would make another statement to the BBC, and to the crowd that had gathered to greet him. Quote, I've come back again rather quicker than I expected, after a journey which, had I not been so preoccupied, I should have found thoroughly enjoyable. Yesterday afternoon I had a long talk with Herr Hitler, and it was a frank talk, but it was a friendly one, and I feel satisfied now that each of us fully understands what is in the mind of the other. You will not, of course, expect me to discuss now what may be the results of these talks, 
What I have got to do now is discuss them with my colleagues. Later, perhaps in a few days, I'm going to have another talk with Herr Hitler, only this time he has told me that it is his intention to come halfway to meet me, that is, to spare an old man such another long journey. End quote. When Chamberlain returned to London, he would first meet with the inner circle group of advisors, where the idea for Plan Z had originated. During these discussions, the overall evaluation of the meeting was a bit less optimistic than what Chamberlain had said to the press, which of course was expected. Then on September 17th, the full cabinet meetings would begin, and there would very quickly be some concerns raised about what had been discussed. The meeting did not get off to a great start, with the opening discussion actually being a report from Runciman, in which he admitted that Henlein and Hitler had probably been working closely together for some time, or as the report would say, quote, had been in much closer touch with Hitler throughout the period of negotiations than he had previously imagined, end quote. This was problematic as it had been the British who had pushed for Henlein to be used as a moderating influence on Hitler during the negotiations, and now they were just admitting that they had been talking before, and so there was no real moderation happening. Then the topic shifted to the meeting. Duff Cooper would write, quote, The bare facts of the interview were frightful. None of the elaborate schemes that we had discussed in Cabinet had even been mentioned. He had felt that the atmosphere did not allow for it. After ranting and raving at him, Hitler had talked about self-determination and asked the PM whether he accepted the principle. The PM had replied that he must consult his colleagues. The PM seemed to expect us all to accept that principle without further discussion because the time was getting on. End quote. Now, while resistance from individuals like Cooper was expected, he's always kind of been pretty outspoken against the current course of British diplomacy, Chamberlain would also begin to lose some of his close supporters over the last two weeks of September. Most of this breakdown would begin only after pressure began to be applied to Czechoslovakia. Before that pressure could be applied, the French would have to be brought into the planning, and so a French delegation arrived in London on September 18th. Marcus is a connoisseur of anything that's free, so he was happy to read the disclaimer on TurboTax Free Edition. Roughly 37% of taxpayers qualify. Form 1040 and limited credits only. See how at TurboTax.com. <laughs> that's me! File your taxes 100% free with TurboTax Free Edition and get your max refund guaranteed. See if you qualify to file for free at TurboTax.com. See max refund guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. The meeting would begin at 11 a.m., at which point the French delegation and a group of British leaders would meet to discuss events. To be clear, there was never any real thought of involving representatives from Czechoslovakia in these conversations, and any decisions would just be made by the British and French and presented to the government in Prague. The French were in a very different position to the British. Now, at this point in September 1938, the British were not officially committed to do anything in regards to Czechoslovakia except for what was mandated by the League of Nations, which were, let's be honest, more like guidelines than any sort of mandatory actions. Daladay and the French government were fully committed by treaties that had been in place since the 1920s, and that they had to come to the aid of Czechoslovakia if the smaller nation was attacked by someone else. What the British were suggesting had a very real possibility of resulting in that kind of war, 
unless the Czechoslovak government agreed to the plan. Daladay was of two minds about any possible solution. On the one hand, he desperately wanted to keep France out of a war, but on the other, he did recognize that France would have to probably honor its treaty commitments. And so he hoped that the solution lay in getting Banesh and his government to agree to a huge compromise. Or to quote Daladay, he wanted to quote, discover some means of preventing France from being forced into a war as a result of her obligations and at the same time to preserve Czechoslovakia and save as much of that country as was humanly possible. A transfer of territory in some way appeared to be the only path forward, but the question did remain of whether or not the French would push for a plebiscite or a simple cession of territory to Germany. Daladay was inclined towards the latter, out of a fear that if a plebiscite was used for the Sudeten Germans, it would set a precedent that would spiral out into many other areas all over Europe. Essentially, he was concerned that if they allowed a plebiscite in Czechoslovakia, what would happen is that any area of Europe that was inside a country that sort of didn't match its uh, ethnic makeup would suddenly want its own plebiscite to join a neighboring country. This concern pushed the conversation definitively towards getting the Czechoslovak government to agree to a transfer of territory. After the initial conversations, the group would break for lunch, and when they returned, the final agreements would be crafted. At a basic level, both governments resolved to push the Czechoslovak government to agree to, quote, accept a position of neutrality and agreeing to act on our advice on issues of peace and war, end quote. Essentially, they were asking the government in Prague to just trust their negotiations and to essentially agree to future decisions sight unseen. In return, both governments would make an international guarantee of the new boundaries that would be made after the territory was transferred. This was seen by Chamberlain as a serious commitment by the British government, as it had, up until this point, avoided most like firm commitments on the continent. It would introduce what Chamberlain called, quote, a very serious additional liability. On the question of getting their agreement, Halifax would say, quote, It should be stated pretty bluntly that if Dr. Banesh did not leave himself in our hands, we should wash our hands of him. Or to put it into, you know, more proper diplomatic language, quote, It should be made quite clear to Dr. Banesh that unless he gave a prompt acceptance of the present proposals, the French and British governments would not hold themselves responsible for the consequences, end quote. While the decisions had been made, Daladay wanted to go back to Paris to discuss the possible solution with his cabinet and get their approval. When he arrived, he found that his cabinet was perhaps a bit less happy with the proposals than the group of British ministers that Daladay had met with in London. Daladay would alter his position somewhat in the face of such opposition, and whereas in London there had been discussion of putting pressure on Prague to arrive at the correct decision, in Paris, Daladay would tell his cabinet that such pressure would not be applied and instead the Czechoslovakian government would be free to make its own choices. Back in London, on the same morning, there was once again a very serious disagreement in the full British cabinet meeting, where they were informed of the agreements that had been made with the French. There was a continued concern about any agreement with Germany, as I mentioned earlier, but now there was the added concern about adding this guarantee as well. The territory that would be removed was pretty well known to play a critical role in the defense of Czechoslovakia. That was one of the reasons that it had been awarded to the new country in the first place. So not only was the British government going to add a guarantee that committed it to a war should Czechoslovakia be invaded, it was also going to remove Czechoslovakia's ability to defend itself. Or as Horbalisha, the state secretary for war, would say, Czechoslovakia would become, quote, an unstable state, economically, would be strategically unsound, and there was no means by which we could implement the guarantee. It was difficult to see how it could survive, end quote. The message that would be given to Prague was delivered on September 19th, or it was communicated to the British and French ambassadors at that time, and they were instructed to deliver it together. They would arrive at noon, and the message that they delivered made it clear that the British and French governments were going to propose to Germany that certain areas of Czechoslovakia be transferred immediately to German possession. This would be done in the interests of maintaining peace. Banesh would bring together his cabinet, representatives from all of the parties that made up his coalition, and the military chiefs of staff to discuss the proposals. They would continue those discussions for almost a day and a half before they summoned the British and French representatives to receive their answer. The message that was delivered was an official rejection of the Anglo-French plan. The reasons given were that they had not been consulted, 
that such a serious alteration of the frontier could not happen without full parliamentary approval, and finally, that they simply did not believe that it would result in peace. David Faber, in Munich 1938, Appeasement and World War II, would describe what happened next. Quote, Soon after the meetings had ended, Delacroix, the French ambassador, was summoned to see the Czech Prime Minister, Milan Hadza. Could Czechoslovakia count on French help or could she not? He was asked. Delacroix was initially too overcome to respond and burst into tears. Although he had no definitive instructions, he replied, his personal belief was that French military support would not be forthcoming. At this, Hadza insisted that Delacroix obtain written confirmation from Paris, emphatically stating that France would back out of its treaty if it came to war. After these conversations had occurred, the response would arrive from London and Paris early on the morning of September 21st. The new instructions were clear that were given to both uh, Delacroix and the British ambassador. Once again, the British and French would speak to Benesh and his government together, and they would ask that the previous answer be reconsidered, and that if it was not, it would very likely lead to an immediate invasion by German forces. Now, the response would continue, quote, We therefore beg the Czech government to consider urgently and seriously before producing a situation for which we could take no responsibility. If on reconsideration the Czech government feel bound to reject our advice, they must of course be free to take any action they think appropriate. Please act immediately on receipt at whatever hour. End quote. Now, it was after 2 a.m. when Banesh was woken to receive the message and a reply was demanded. And there was added time pressure as well, with Chamberlain wanting to provide a response to Hitler in person within the next 48 hours. Banesh would eventually respond, stating, quote, After all the efforts which he and his government had made, they were being abandoned. He would then state that all of the previous guarantees that he had received had been worthless, and that the solution now presented would not result in peace, but instead simply in German domination. However, due to the contents of the proposals, he could not make the decision on his own and needed full cabinet approval, so once again, Banesh would meet with his close advisors. They would agree to accept the proposals, and a full cabinet meeting was then called a few hours later. There was strong disagreement among the cabinet and the military, but in the end, they would agree. Banesh would ask for written confirmation of the Anglo-French guarantees, something that had only been communicated to him verbally, and he wanted that written confirmation before his agreement was like finalized, but he was told that it was dangerous to start placing new conditions on the agreement. When the official acceptance was given to the delegations, Banesh would state, we have been disgracefully betrayed. Part of the official note that was provided to the British and French would read, quote, the Czechoslovak government, forced by circumstances, yielding to unheard of pressure and drawing the consequences from the communication of the British and French governments of September 21st, 1938, in which both governments expressed their point of view as to help for Czechoslovakia in case she should refuse to accept the Franco-British proposals and should be attacked by Germany, accepts the Anglo-French proposals with a feeling of pain. Assuming that both governments will do everything in order to safeguard the vital interests of the Czechoslovak state in their application, it notes with regret that these proposals were elaborated without previous consultation with the Czechoslovak government. End quote. Then at 7 p.m., a broadcast was made by the government to make a statement to the people, and it would say in part, quote, The Czechoslovak government was told that Great Britain and France would be unable to afford any help to Czechoslovakia in the event of her being attacked by Germany, which would happen if Czechoslovakia did not immediately agree in principle to the cession of the territories with German population to the Reich. Since the Soviet Union could afford us military help only in company with France, or alternatively, if France would not act, until Germany had been declared an aggressor by the League of Nations, we found ourselves faced with the threat of war, which would endanger not merely the present boundaries of our state, but even the very existence of the Czechs and Slovaks as one indivisible nation. The government is quite decided to maintain order with all the means at its disposal and to protect in every way the independence and freedom of the nation under the new conditions which will be consequently obtained. The President of the Republic, therefore, together with the government, could not do anything but accept the plans of the two great powers as the basis of further negotiations. We had no other choice because we were left alone. <laughs>